So in, in this week's parashas, we're learning the stories of our forefathers. And um, so this connects with the um, mitzvahs, those of the 613 mitzvahs, which actually predate the giving of the Torah and go to the others. And a couple of weeks ago, we did a class on the history of tzedakah, where we looked at the Rambam and Hilchah's Melachim, where the Rambam says that Yitzchak is the one who initiated the mitzvah of Meiser, of giving tithes, and we discussed whether that means tithes of a tenth of a money to tzedakah, it means about the tithes of the fields, and we spoke about Avram giving Meiser, Yaakov giving Meiser, etc. So today, um, I want to continue that theme a little bit and talk about the mitzvah of Gid Hanoshe, which we read yesterday in the Torah, Pasha Pasha Yishlach, the mitzvah that after Yaakov Avinu wrestled with the Malach, the Torah commands us that we should not eat from the Gid Hanoshe, the sciatic nerve. And um, I'll just read to you a very interesting piece. So a little bit, um, some of the themes that we're going to talk about today were actually touched upon between Mincha and Mariv during the week. Um, but uh, of course, and bringing it all together. Yes? When Yaakov tells Esau, he, he, he tells him that he observed the that's the first time in the Torah that it's mentioned, the Torah mitzvahs. The first time there's an allusion to the fact that there are 613 mitzvahs right. is um, Love and Garti, which Rashi brings is the gematria of Taryag. I kept the 613 right. mitzvahs. Now, um, the truth is that nowadays, um, for the most part, we don't eat the whole hind of the animal which is a very interesting topic. In Eretz Yisrael, there are some experts who have a tradition of how to do nikur, how to properly cleanse the back of the animal from the forbidden fats, and of course, from also from the Gid Hanosha, because the Gid Hanosha is, we pass on that the Gid Hanosha is the both hind legs. I'll touch upon that a little bit more in a minute. Um, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to explore further why, um, why we don't uh, sort of reinvigorate um, the... the, the practice of nikur, which Lechayra would save, uh, would bring down the price of kosher meat and possibly the taste of kosher meat considerably, um, but I, I don't really know the answer, and um, anyway, maybe one day we'll touch on that. So, I'll read to you a fascinating paragraph from the Sefer HaChinuch, the Sefer HaChinuch, as we've seen him many times, um, with every mitzvah, he gives what he calls the Sharoshe HaMitzvah, some of the underlying uh, principles or reasons for the mitzvah. He says that the Sharoshe HaMitzvah Zu, Shekateshe Teiremez the Yisrael, so that it should be an illusion for the Jew- Jewish people. Even though they will suffer many tra- troubles in the various exiles, at the hand of the nations, and specifically at the hand of Esau's descendants, right, who, as we know, um, the, the, the person who is wrestling with Yaakov is the representative, the angel, the minister uh, representing Esau. So, so, so this mitzvah reminds us that we should um, be assured that we will not be lost. That our, uh, their descendants and their identity will endure forever. I'm reading to you from the Arts Call Translation. And that the Redeemer will ultimately come to them and redeem them from the hand of the enemy. Now that when they recall this matter constantly, Aliyad Mitzvah HaMitzvah Shetim is occurring through observing the mitzvah of refraining from eating the Gidhan Osha, which is intended to serve as our remembrance. And imagine um, back in the day where you prepared your own food, so you, every individual who was preparing meat would shech the animal and uh, themselves remove the Gidhan Osha. So Yam Dubam and Osam Tzkasam Elam, we will remain steadfast in our faith and our righteousness forever. This illusion is contained in the mitzvah because that angel who fought with our forefather Yaakov, who, as per our tradition, was the ministering angel of Esav, wanted to uproot Yaakov from this world, both him and his descendants. But, lo yochiloi, in the words of the Pasuk, he could not defeat him. And so to make some impact, he infl- afflicted Jacob by striking his thigh. And similarly, throughout the generations, Esav's descendants afflict Yaakov's descendants, but ultimately Yaakov's descendants will have a salvation from them. For just as we find regarding the forefather that the sun rose for him in order to effect his healing, and he was thus delivered from his affliction, so too will the son of Mashiach rise for us, the offspring, and heal us from our affliction and redeem us. Amen. So the Sefer Chinuch, um, who, by the way, it's interesting, he doesn't usually get into um, such, um, let's call this... Uh, Midrashic or or or, or a dr- yeah drash drash style reasons is usually more 
the word that I have right now is rational reasons, but he really is uh, is magnifying this idea that th- this is a sorry show. This this is not just an episode that Yaakov wrestles with this angel. This is a core part of our history that Esau tries to get us, and the lesson is. The reason why it's important that we always remember this story, and we have this mitzvah of Gita Nosha, so that we always remember the story, is because we have to remember that whenever a, this is this is going to go on throughout many years of Golos, that Esav is going to try to get us, and we have to remember that a, a he's not going to manage to get us lo and b, just like in the original story, Yaakov is healed from the injury, so to ha- Mashiach will come to heal us from the injury, from the suffering of Golos. There's an interesting machlokas in Binigei Gitanosh, I mentioned before, that we paskin that that uh, both the, the hind, the, the sciatic nerve from both the hind legs is forbidden under Gitanosh. However, <coughs> in the Gemara there's brought the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, it's in Chol and Tzadik Tess, Amit Beis, that only the right leg, Gidhanosha, is forbidden. The last one is permissible. And the Gemara explains, and um, I don't know if we have any experts in wrestling over here, but uh, the Gemara explains that it's because Rabbi Hudu's opinion is based on the fact that we assume that if somebody's going to wrestle somebody and hit his thigh, it's going to be the right thigh that will be injured. And so, to mem- commemorate that, we only uh, abstain from the right um, Gidhanosha. Now, we don't pass in that way, but it's interesting to note, and I saw this word um, from Abzal Menachem Goldberg. Abzal Menachem Goldberg, al Shalom, has a sefer on, um, where he goes through the reasons for the mitzvahs and how the reasons impact the halacha of the mitzvah. And uh, usually, we, we pass in that, Loida Shinan Tami Dekra, means that if the Torah gives a mitzvah, we don't say, well, the reason for this mitzvah is X, Y, Z, and therefore if that reason doesn't apply, the mitzvah doesn't apply. And the most famous example of this is, it's a machalikus in the Gemara, but the most famous example of it is, Loisachvil Beged Almona. There's a prohibition in the Torah that you're not allowed to take a, um, a, a mashkin, a, um, what's the word? Collateral, from a widow. So the assumption is, why is the Torah forbidding us from taking collateral from a widow? Because uh, we, we could assume that a widow is a person who's in financial uh, uh, challenge, financially challenged, and therefore we don't do it. So, well, if that's the case, then what about a widow who's the richest person in the world when her husband just died? Are you allowed to take collateral from her? So the answer is, we pass, and you're not allowed to, because Loida should in time to the even though you're right that the reason for the mitzvah is because usually wi- wi- um, widows are poor, but the fact is the mitzvah applies to, um, to all cases. So here we have Rabbi Huda saying it only applies to the right leg of the animal um, because, that's, because we don't eat it to commemorate a wrestle and wrestlers <coughs> usually affect the right leg. Well, okay, so since when do we take the mit- reasons on the mitzvahs into account? So Rabbi Goldberg suggests that the reason is because the Torah says Git HaNosha in the singular, so it's, there seems to be an implication in the Torah that it's only one of the two, and therefore, if we're going to go about deciding which one of the two it should be, um, we, um, we, uh, we we choose the right leg. Okay, fine. Be that as it may, we have the mitzvah of Gidanosha. We we we, 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 we remove the Gidanosha from both legs. In fact, Lamaisa, we remove the Gidanosha, we the whole hind of the animal. Okay, says the Rambam. Al Shisha again. We learned this Rambam already two weeks ago. We're going to review it now. Al Shisha Dvarim Nitzava Adam Harishin. Adam Harishin was commanded six things: Alavei Dezara, idolatry, Al Birkas Hashem, blasphemy, Al Shvichas Dami, murder, Al Gilu Aroyes, which is both incest and adultery, Al Hagazel, and theft. Al Hadinim, and according to Rambam, that means the obligation to set up a proper, just um, system of justice. And according to the Rambam, this is why the people of Shechem, as we read yesterday, were um, deserving of being put to death because they neglected to judge Shechem and Chamor for kidnapping and raping Dina. Even though all of these six mitzvahs, it's tradition from Moshe Rabbeinu um, that they were given to Noach and 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 it seems uh, it seems clear that these are it, it's, it seems reasonable that these are good mitzvahs nevertheless even implicit in the psukim 
that Noach was given these mitzvahs. Okay. Hosef the Noach Ever min hachai. Shenama ach bosu ben ach shedom elisechelu. Noach was given the mitzvah of Ever min hachai. Why? Why was Noach only given that mitzvah? Because, as the Rambam says um, earlier, I think or maybe later, but as the Rambam says that uh, uh, until the time of Noach there was no heter to eat meat at all, to consume animals at all. So if, there's, if, they, if they're forbidden to eat meat, so then obviously there's no, there's no reason to prohibit Eva Menachai, not allowed to eat any meat. It's only after the flood when Noach was given the right to slaughter and eat animals, so now he was also given the mitzvah of Eva Menachai. Nimtzu Sheva Mitzvah, so that's why we have seven mitzvahs, and we all know the seven Noahide laws, this is where it comes from. This is how history continued. Ad Avram, until ten generations later when Avram Avinu came. Ba Avram, now listen very carefully to these words. Ba Avram, Avram came v'nitztava, and he was commanded, Yasser Aleilu, in addition to these, b'mila. He was commanded, in addition to these, with the mitzvah of mila. Now if there's time at the end of the class today, when we talk, finish talking about Gitanosha, I believe there will be time, we're going to get talk a little bit more about mila. So remember those words. Who is Pal Shachris? He Daman Shachris. Yitzchak Kifrish Maisa, as we discussed two weeks ago, Yitzchak, according to the Rambam, is the one who separated and initiated the mitzvah of Maisa. Voice of Tfilah Charis of Nesayim and initiated the afternoon prayer. The Yaakov and Yaakov, Hosef Gid Hanosha, added the mitzvah of. Gid Hanosheh, that's what we're talking about here. Ve'hispal al-Arvis and Hidav and Mairev. In Mitzrayim, Nitztava, Amram, B'mitzvah, Yisairis. In Mitzrayim, Amram was given more mitzvahs, and we've discussed that before. Where does Ramam get it from, that Amram was given more mitzvahs? Ad Sheba Moshe Rabbeinu, also very important words, pay attention. Until Moshe Rabbeinu came, V'nishlama Teira al-Yodoi, and the Teira was completed through him. Okay, so we have seven mitzvahs on Noach. Everyone adds the mitzvahs. Yaakov is the one who adds Gitanosha, as we just discussed the story. And uh, Moshe Rabbeinu completes the mitzvah. So, there is a Mishnah in Chulin Daf Kufa Midbeis where we have a machlokus between the Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda. I'll read to you the words of the Mishnah. The Tanakama says, The prohibition of Gitanosha applies to kosher animals, but does not apply to non kosher animals. There's no prohibition to eat the Gitanosha of a non kosher animal, huh? You can't it eat the whole, can't eat the whole man animal at all. So of course, you can. Sense. <laughs> oh, oh, very good. So it doesn't make any sense if the animal's not kosher. You're not allowed to eat any part of a horse. So of course, you can't eat the gitanosha of a horse. So what's going on over here? Behuda Aimer, we'll get back to that in a minute. Behuda Aimer, after Tmei, Behuda says no. The mitzvah of gitanosha does apply to non-kosher animals. Okay, so what's what, what's going on over here? What's this machlekes? So in order to understand, so, so there's two options of. There's two ways to understand this machlekes, basically, <coughs> and that is by introducing the fact that there is a um, machlekes whether or not gidim, um, which I think we translate as sinews, are benois in tam. Is that considered part of the uh, part of the edible part of the animal? Right. For example, if a person were to eat. Um, in other words, uh, let, let's talk about a horse. A horse is not kosher; it doesn't show its cud. And it doesn't. It does have hooves, but it doesn't have split hooves. Um, now, what if a person consumes a piece of I don't know the the, the the tooth of a horse? Is he liable for eating non-kosher animal? The answer is no. It's not an edible part of the animal. So there is a machlokes as to whether or not the gid, the sinews, are considered food. So there is an opinion that says in the gid in time, the gid is not considered. Um, food and so, if a person were to devour a whole horse, that would be not kosher. But if he were to devour just the gid hanasha of the horse, at least on the biblical level, that would not be a prohibition because it's not considered edible. So that's what the Tanakam is saying: that if you eat the gid hanasha, the mitzvah of gid hanasha only applies to kosher animals because a non-kosher animal, it's not considered edible. There's no prohibition to eat it. Now, of course. And in kosher animal, it's also not considered edible. But the Torah specifically tells you not to not eat something that's not edible, then obviously that's included in the mitzvah. In other words, when the Torah tells you don't eat something, we say, okay, that applies to edible parts of that thing. But if the Torah tells you don't eat, imagine if the Torah to tell you to tell you don't eat wood. Well, you wouldn't say, oh, well, I can eat wood because wood's not edible. No, that's what the Torah is telling you not to do. So if the Torah tells you don't eat gidanosha, gidanosha is not edible. But the Torah tells you not to eat it. So when it comes to the gidanosha of a, a kosher animal, you're not allowed to eat it. But the gidanosha of a non-kosher animal, 
according to the Tanakh Kamer, it's not included in the prohibition of Gitan Dasha, because Gitan Dasha only applies to kosher animals. It's not included in the prohibition against eating non-kosher animals because it's not edible. And so, um, according to them, there would not be any biblical violation in eating the Gitan Dasha of a horse. Okay, but you said that in Eretz Yisrael, if they remove this, then they could eat the hind quarters of the, of the cow. Yes, well, it's not just that. It's other... It's all the forbidden fats are also in the back of the animal. Because my, my sphere, I was so, he had a neighbor who was a shochet. He used to go to Argentina half the year. He knew how to take right, it out. Right, like I said, in Israel there are he people who know how to, to do it. He knew how to take it out. Yes, there are people who are familiar with this. All right. <laughs> Okay, that's one way of understanding this machloikus. Um, even if you say that there is a yesh beginning in some time, you could say, well, if somebody would eat the, uh, the gid hanosha of a non-kosher of a horse, would he get one set of malchus, one set of lashes for eating a horse, or would he get two, two for eating horse and for eating uh, gid hanosha? Okay. Again, bottom line is we have a machloikus of Yehuda and Tanakama. Tanakama says the prohibition to gid hanosha pertains exclusively to kosher animals. The Yehuda says gid hanosha applies also to non-kosher animals. How could you say that Git Hanosha pertains exclusively to kosher animals? Surely the children of Yaakov were already precluded from eating Git Hanosha, and they were not precluded from eating non kosher animals. Until Matan Torah, there was no prohibition to consume animals that did not chew their cud. So you're telling me that the children of Yaakov, so, so, so if the children of Yaakov were told, don't eat the Gid of any animal, that include the non-kosher animals. So then when the Torah comes along and says, don't eat horses, the Torah hasn't removed the prohibition um, not to eat the Gid of the horse, so they both apply. Amrulai, so the Chacham said back to him, no, you're wrong. The Sinai Namar, this Pasuk was said, at Har Sinai. Elo Shanichta Bum but it was written in the place where the story occurred. Let me, let me read the Rashi on this. Pasuk Zeshir Olav Besinai Nemar. This Pasuk was said at Sinai. At Sinai Loi Nezuhusaru. Says Rashi, until Math and Torah, until the giving of the Torah, there was no prohibition to eat um, to eat the Gitanosha. After the mitzvah was given at Sinai, it was cut and pasted into the um, the story in Parshas Yishlach. The Kosa v'Sidir Moshe as a Torah when Moshe wrote and organized the Torah. Kosa v'Mikra Azal Maisal Kein Husar Bnei Yisrael Ach Kein Shodeich Ligud Anasha. He inserted the pasuk over there after the Torah relates the story of Yaakov wrestling with the Malach of Esav, so that we should understand Al Kein. We should be given on the reason and the context for the mitzvah. So the way Rashi explains it, the, the Machloikas of Yehuda and the Chachamim, it all boils down to when was the mitzvah of Gita Noshe initiated. According to Yehuda, the mitzvah of Gita Noshe um, started right then. After the story happens, the mitzvah is given, Yaakov, um, you, don't, uh, you don't have the Gita no- you, you're not allowed to eat Gita Noshe. Now, again, at that time, they were still permit- permitted to eat horse meat. And so, obviously, the Gita Nosha applies to cows and to horses. So they were not allowed to eat the Gita Nosha of horses. Then the Torah was given and initiated a new mitzvah not to eat horse meat. Okay, but that doesn't take away the fact that the Gita Nosha pro- prohibition applies to horse meat. That's what we opinion. Says the Chacham, no, there's no mitzvah not to eat Gita Nosha before Matan Torah. They could have continued eating Gita Nosha throughout, and they could have been, um, yeah, they could have been eating Gita Nosha all the time. Only when the Torah was given was there a new mitzvah invented, not invented, uh, given, that um, you're not allowed to eat the Gita Nosha, and we inserted the Pasuk over there. Okay. So one does so now, override the other. Right. So now, when we see the Rambam, and the Rambam says, as we just saw before, that Yaakov Hosef Gid HaNosha, that the mitzvah of Gid HaNosha was initiated by Yaakov, right? So now, I'm going to ask you guys, think, put together everything we've just said, when it comes to the question of does Gid HaNosha apply to non-kosher animals, what should the Rambam be saying? According to the Chacham? Again, the Rambam paskins that Yaakov initiated the Yaakov host of Gid Anosha. So who's he paskining like? The Chacham and Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Huda. The Chacham said Yaakov didn't give Gid Anosha. Rabbi Huda is the one who says that Gid Anosha applied all along. Rabbi Huda is the one who says that Gid Anosha applied all along. 
Rabbi Huda says that the children of Yaakov were already commanded to give it Hanasha. That seems to fit with the Rambam, right? Vi Yaakov, Hosef, Gid Hanasha. So now, if I'm going to open up the, in the Rambam the, to the Rambam to the laws of Gid Hanasha, and I'm going to see whether or not Gid Hanasha applies to horse meat, what should I expect to find? Come on, somebody say something. <laughs> It's prohibited, right? Yeah, it does apply, right? right. Rabbi Huda sh- should apply to non-kosher meat, right? So, surprise, surprise, open up Hilchas Machalos Asuris, chapter 8, Halacha 5, hey, Machalos Asuris, Perkas Halacha 8. Ha'oichel gid hanosha me behem avachai hatameim. If somebody eats the gid hanosha of a non-kosher species of animal, potter! He is exempt. The fisha ain't a noyak betameya, ela behem shakula moteras. Um, because the, uh, because on the one hand the mitzvah of Gid Hanosha does not apply to non-kosher animals and also the Gid is not considered edible so you wouldn't get lashes for eating Gid Hanosha because that doesn't apply to non-kosher animals and also you wouldn't get lashes for eating non-kosher animal meat because the Gid Hanosha is not considered meat and so you're off the hook Right? So this seems to be a blatant contradiction, a blatant stira in the Rambam that in Hilchus Malachim he says Yaakov hosts of Gid Hanosha which seems to imply that he paskins like Rabbi Yehuda that um, that Yaakov initiated the mitzvah of Gita Nasha. But in Hilchis Machalus Asuris, he paskins that the Gita of uh, the, uh, the prohibition of Gita Nasha does not pertain to non kosher animals like the Chachamim. It's a moot point, though, isn't it? Really? Why is it moot? Because we don't eat non-kosher meat anyway. Yeah, but we so it, it, you're saying it, it's not moot. You're saying it's not practically relevant to any of us. This is oh, true, okay. but I, we've just learned in Tanya last week and this week mm-hmm. and, and and many times throughout <coughs> Tanya that the mitzvah of limit Torah and it's not a chiddush of Rebbe, but Alter Rebbe mm-hmm. really focused on this. The mitzvah of Torah study is not just to study aspects of Torah which are practically relevant to us. Any part of Torah is the mitzvah of Torah study. So even though okay. you and I are never eating the Gitan Nasher of any animal, hopefully, um, but uh, still, we still have to understand the Rambam. And also, Bob, um, Reb Ruven has a history of not being able to fall asleep when he doesn't understand the Rambam. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to make sure that um, he's going to have a good night's sleep tonight. It might also have to do a little bit with that machine, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, for his sake. so <laughs> Oops, sorry. when I read to you the Rambam before, the last words of the of the halacha were initial al that until Moshe Rabbeinu came and the Torah was completed by him, which could give the impression, as we will see in a moment, this is the wrong impression. That this is like a build-up. We have seven, six from Adam and then Noah gets the seventh, and then Avram adds this, and Yitzchak adds this, and Yaakov adds this, Amram adds this, and then, okay, now we're up to, let's say, 20, and then um, Moshe Rabbeinu comes and gives another 590, whatever it is, and now we have a total of 613, right? That's what you would think from reading the, this Ramam. And in fact, I don't really have a good answer to that question, this, this question of Nishlam al al-Yodi, that the Torah was completed by Moshe Rabbeinu, um, does seem to indicate that. And this is a question that is asked already by Rabbi Yosef Engel um, in, in, um, in uh, oh my gosh, in, in Beis HaOitzer. And um, uh, you could get, find many different approaches to try and explain it uh, from, with Lambdas from Brisk and others. We're not going to get into that right now. However, um, for the, the, the main takeaway from this, for that, what I want to present, is that actually that is not the case. We're not, it's, not, it's not the case that Moshe Rabbeinu completed the, the count to 613. What actually happens is that when the Torah, when it comes that we have all these mitzvahs, the seven Noahide laws and Avram and Yitzhak, comes Math and Torah, factory reset. We're back to zero and we get a whole brand new 613 mitzvahs from Moshe Rabbeinu. Let's see this in the words of the Rambam in his commentary to this very Mishnah. Well, wait. The same. It's like they're new. It's like they're, they're put into concrete uh, commandments. Do they have are, are almost, Do they have concrete commandments, or are they just Who? inherently new? The, no, now, they now they're new. Things. Now they're new. Let's see the Rama. Okay. Pay attention to this very great principle. Or to this great principle. 
Um, these are the words of the sages that say that Gid HaNosha was prohibited from Sinai. V'hushat atzarech l'das, you need to know. Shakal ma'asha anun is harmi meno yaisim. Anything that we abstain from doing or or are careful to do, in other words, any Aveiro or any Mitzvah, we do, we do it exclusively because of the commandment from Hashem to Moshe. Not because, um, not because Moshe, Hashem commanded to the, um, to the prophets preceding Moshe Rabbeinu, for example, we abstain from Eivim Nachai. Not because Hashem forbade the Noahites from eating Eivim Nachai. From that, that, from the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us at Sinai that Eivim Nachai remains also. We do not circumcise ourselves because Avram circumcised himself and his household, the members of his household. But rather because Hashem commanded us through Moshe Rabbeinu that we should circumcise ourselves like Avram Avinu did. Okay, back to our mission. So to Gidanosha. We don't continue this prohibition. Because Yaakov Avinu prohibited it. But because of the, um, of the commandment of Moshe Rabbeinu. And he says, you see that this is implicit in the words of Chazal, the famous words of Chazal, that Moshe at Sinai was given 613 mitzvahs. We don't say that Moshe at Sinai was giving 500 mitzvahs and change, and then if you add up all the previous ones, it comes to 613. We say, no, Moshe was given 613 mitzvahs at Sinai. So that is, teaches us this principle, that all of the mitzvahs that we do today, we're doing not because they were there previously, but because they were given at Sinai. And so, this is one approach to understanding this Rambam. This is um, attributed to the Chassam Sefer in his commentary to Chulin. It's on the previous Ahmed and Chulin Dafkuf Ahmed Aleph. And um, over there, the Chassam Sefer says that um, the Chassam Sefer says that Yaakov Avinu, tr- it's tr- that, that Yaakov Avinu in, in fact, abstained from the Gid HaNosheh. And that's why the Rambam writes, the Yaakov Hosef Gid HaNosheh, because it's true, the Yaakov and throughout his generations, they, um, they kept Gid HaNosheh. But it was, it was re-given at Sinai, and therefore, because it's a new mitzvah at Sinai, that's why the Rambam also passes like the Chachamim, that it only applies to kosher animals. And he says an interesting thing. The Torah says, the, with the words of the Pasuk are, Therefore, the Jewish people will not eat the Gid ad hayoyim hazeh, until this very day. Now, it would seem that the mitzvah, the words ad hayoyim hazeh, like, I mean, obviously it implies, it, it, uh, eating Gid, uh, like any mitzvah, uh, mitzvahs are eternal. Why would specifically, when it comes to the mitzvah Gid does it say that we should do this mitzvah ad hayoyim hazeh? Now, ad hayoyim hazeh is found many times in Tanakh, and it usually means something that's like still ongoing. Uh, it's a whole discussion, actually, of um, uh, what other because c- c- in some places in the Torah, the, like the Torah says, like this remains the name of this in this location. Mm-hmm. Adam well, that may have been true when the Torah was given. It's not true in 2022. Uh, that place may no longer be called whatever the Torah says it's called. So that's a whole discussion. But anyway, says says some sefer. Obviously, a mitzvah. Is eternal. Why is eternal? Need to say Adayim Mitzvah. El al karka chinigu gemi nei yisom liyad ba'achka knetzav al karka b'sinai. Rather, we say like this: the Jewish people created this custom of not eating gidanosha immediately, and afterwards they were commanded by it in Sinai. So at Sinai, when Moshe Rabbeinu tells this mitzvah to the Jewish people, that's when he says Adayim Mitzvah. Therefore, the Jewish people abstain from eating. Bnei Yisrael abstain from eating the mitzvah Adayim Mitzvah until this day, until Matan Torah. And now I'm command, and it wasn't a mitzvah until now. They just did it on a oh, voluntary, sure. commemorative basis. And now it's becoming a mitzvah. And I'm telling you um, that you're that, that um, I'm telling you that we're going to continue doing it. And basically, what the Chassam Sefer wants to say is that the difference between the Rabbi Huda and the Rabbi so, so, in other words, what comes out according to Chassam Sefer, what comes out is this: everybody agrees that, in fact, historically, we abstain from eating Gid Hanosha all the way back to Yaakov Avinu. You know, the difference is that Rabbi Yehuda holds it was a mitzvah. Rabbi Yehuda holds it was a mitzvah that Hashem commanded him not to eat Gid Hanosha. and the Chachamim hold 
No, they just abstained from it from their own volition, and then later it became a mitzvah. It was a minhag. It was a minhag, exactly. <laughs> I noticed the passion in that. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now. Teach you all something. He mentions here, uh, he deals with it, he mentions an interesting man in Gemara earlier that says, we're going to read, uh, where are we now? Right? Now we started Vayeshev, and the next week is Miketz Vayiga. So in two weeks' time, we're going to read that uh, when Yosef invites his brothers in, to, to they have dinner in his house. So it says, mm-hmm. So the Gemara says that part of the preparing the food was they made sure to remove the Gid Hanosha in front of them so that they should see there's no Gid Hanosha over them. So Gemara says that's because according to the opinion that Gid HaNosheh was forbidden already to the Bnei Noyach. So he says, how, how does that fit with the Chachamim who say there was no mitzvah of Gid HaNosheh? But anyway, that's just an interesting error point. Again, so to summarize, let's just summarize again. The Chacham Soifer says, this is how we're going to reconcile the Rambam. Everybody agrees that in fact, they did not eat Gid HaNosheh. The difference is that Rabbi Yehuda holds it was a mitzvah not to eat Gid HaNosheh before Matan Torah. Chachamim hold it was a... Minhag. Minhag, there we go. And... Um, that's why the Rambam does pass like the Chachamim throughout that um, Git HaNosheh does not apply to non-kosher animals. Now the truth is, remember I said to you when I read this, pay, pay close attention. Didn't we just the Rambam said, sorry, one, we, one, one, moment, one moment, if you read the Rambam again, he says, Bo Avram, and Avram came, it's Tava Yesar Leil Alamino, he was commanded concerning circumcision. That's the only time the Rambam uses he was commanded. All the other ones he says, Yitzchak, Separated mice. He doesn't say Yitzchak was commanded to separate mice. Huh? Yaakov Hosef Gidanosha. Yaakov added Gidanosha. He doesn't say Yaakov was commanded Gidanosha. So it can, and this, this point is made by the Kesef Mishnah. The Chesam Sefer does not quote this Kesef Mishnah as far as I can tell, but um, it's, the Kesef Mishnah does seem to lend. Cre- um, um, uh, what's the word? Lend um, credibility. credibility to the approach of the Chesam Sefer that. Yaakov himself initiated the, mit- the, the, the midhag of Gidanosha. It wasn't actually a full fledged mitzvah. Yes, Ruvid. No, that's exactly. I was just thinking we talked about it with Bris Mila before. Right. That he was commanded. That he was commanded, or was it. We had the same argument, I think. Okay, well, maybe, we'll get, yeah. maybe we mentioned that in a minute. We're going to get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, okay, an alternative approach is. One second. Yeah, the, the, the other approach is um, perhaps a little bit sim- more simple, is that, um, and this is suggested by many, including the Rosh Yosef, which is the Prima Godim in his commentary to Cholin, where he says, based on the Rambam that I read to you before from the Mishnah Torah, that we only do the mitzvahs because of Moshe Rabbeinu, so I think I already... I probably already said this when we read the Rambam, and I, I just put it in the wrong place in my source sheet. But it's the, it's the, 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 the also quotes that Rambam, but the Rosh Hashanah, the Prima Godim, is the one who says, based on that Rambam and Persia Mishnah, that yes, even if you hold that there was a mitzvah before um, Matan Torah, even it could be the Chum also agree that there was a mitzvah mm-hmm. that forbade them from eating Gidan Asha. But yet, there was still a factory reset when it comes to Matan Torah, and that's why these two Rambams are not mysterious. Okay, so that's the end of the. Gid Hanosha discussion for today. I want to read to you a fascinating letter from the Rambam, and then we're going to move on um, to discuss a little bit the mitzvah of circumcision, which is different than Gid Hanosha in this regard. So this is a, Ramb- a letter written by the Rambam to Mr. Yosef Ibn Jabbar. Okay? Um, and um, there's many editions. I'm going to read it to you from this edition. Um, if anybody wants to look it up in the Shailat edition of the Rambam, it's on page Tuf Yud, which technically is volume two, although in this edition they've published both volumes in one book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so this is a, Ram- a letter from the Rambam where, um, as, as a number of letters of the Rambam, are defending against attacks that he came under for this, the book of Mishnah Torah. And he addresses these... Um, 
these attacks, and it, he gets quite defensive. Okay. You mentioned, uh, let me just see the beginning, yeah, he, he's responding to a letter. So you mentioned in your letter, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Jabbar, um, You're saying, that you're, you're challenging that which I have written, that we do the mitzvah um, for circumcision because of Moshe Rabbeinu, not because of Avram Avinu. How could you say that we do the mitzvah of Milo because of Moshe Rabbeinu, not because of Avram Avinu? This would g- fly in the face of what the Gemara says that there are Yud Gimel Brises, there are 13 covenants that are said about the, 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 the mitzvah of circumcision. Now, where are these 13 covenants found? It's 13 times the word bris is found in Parshas Lech Lecha, where it talks about Avram Avinu doing the mitzvah of Milo. So, they're saying to the Rambam, how could you say that we're doing the mitzvah because of Moshe, not because of Avram Avinu? Surely, the Gemara says that we do the mitzvah of Mila and we have 13 covenants. So, that's clearly um, um, invoking the Pesukim and Parshish Lechelcha. V'zeh sichlus This was a very foolish thing for you to say. This is proof that the person who said this knows nothing about the foundations of Judaism. And the way I put it, says the Ramam, he talks about himself in the plural, like the royal we. Um, the, the, the way I, we, we put it is the truth, which cannot be doubted. Including in the 613 mitzvahs that were said to Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai are the mitzvah of circumcision and the mitzvah of Gidanosha. But they were that like the, like Chazal say, and again referring to this mission in Chulim that we read before, that it was given at Sinai, but in cut and pasted to be to be written in in its in its place, meaning in in, in the story. We follow the commandment of Sinai. Shekiem lono isagidanosha who um, extended or. Uh, how do you say? Um, Festgestalt. Uh, Instantiated. Say that? Instantiated? What does that mean? Substantiated? Consecrated. All right, whatever it was, to continue the midst of Gidanosha. Hamuktam, that was already there previously. Vahamila Hamuktam, as in the midst of Hamila, that was already there previously. And by the way, the implication of this Rambam is more like, uh, I, I, I doubt the Chasam Sofer saw this letter of the Rambam, but. Um, I don't think it was uh, published uh, widely available in his day, but um, but 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 um, but this does seem to imply more like the Rosh Yosef, who says that there was actually it wasn't just a custom in Minhag; it was an actual mitzvah before. Um, although, like we said, the Rambam doesn't say the word Nitztava, so that remains somewhat ambiguous. Says the Rambam, the Yudgim of Brisas and his Kares Bemila, the thirteen covenants that are mentioned in in the Mila, Roy Lishal Ela Hasumim. You should ask these blind people, Shem Roitzim his Kares Bevalu Yehonaim, who are trying to uh, provoke those who do have eyes, Veloimalaim, and tell them, Haim Haksuvim Sheyesh Brisas Ba'ashi Yudgim Brisas Namal Avram Avinu V'Chibra Mavram Achsamim. Do you really think that the thirteen Brisas, the words Bris that are found in Parshas Lech Lecha, were conveyed to and written by Avraham Avinu? And do you really think that Moshe Rabbeinu took the Pesukim that were written by Avram and copied them into the Torah? <coughs> as the, um, as the um, fakers, right? I don't know exactly what those words mean. Or do you admit, you blind people, um, that <laughs> do you blind people admit that those words of Parshish Lechlecha were actually given and said by God to Moshe Rabbeinu? Anybody who doesn't believe that these psukim in the, together with the entirety of the Torah were told to Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai from God, well, he doesn't say at Sinai, were told to Moshe from God, is a, a heretic by virtue of the fact that he doesn't believe that the whole Torah was given by God. From where would we know? How would Moshe Rabbeinu know? How in the world does Moshe Rabbeinu know what God told Avram in Pashas Lechlecha, if not for the fact 
that God told him so at Sinai. We know this from Moshe Ben at Sinai. In Cain, summarizes Rambam. The, we, we, we got this mitzvah from Moshe Rabbeinu. We got the 13 brisos from Moshe Rabbeinu. We got the 13 brisos from Moshe Rabbeinu. From what Hashem told him. This is very clear and can only be um, hidden from somebody who has never paid attention to learning Torah and has wasted his whole life in Sarigim. I don't know what that means, in thorns. Um, anyway. It does. Right. <laughs> Basically, and uh, da 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 da. And to, contin- to, 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 to elaborate on this any longer would be an absolute waste, waste of time. The end. Um, <laughs> okay? <laughs> what are you reading? <laughs> And that's it. Okay. So softly spoken. All right. So the Rambam, it's very. I, it was one of the reasons. I, one of the reasons why I really love this book. You really, <laughs> you, you really, uh, you really get to see the personality of the Rambam. There's actually a very interesting story. Uh, I think it's in the same letter. Uh, let me see. Do I have my bookmark still? I just left, lost my bookmark. Uh, I think it's later in the same letter where the Rambam writes. It's in one of these letters. I, I, you know, I post my daily things on the Rambam. So when we get to the Rambam, that's going to be on that, on that uh, thing. I'm going to, I'm going to quote this letter of the Rambam, where the Rambam writes that uh, one of the controversies about the Rambam was that he didn't write the sources for his laws, and he actually writes in that letter that he intended or hoped to get a chance to sort of go back and and, and write all the sources. But I promise you, all the sources are there in the Talmud. Anyway, so he writes this story that one time somebody came to me and said, you know, this halach, you write, where does it say this? He said, oh, it's in the sugya. And I looked up the sugya and it wasn't there. And I looked at this gemara and I looked at this gemara and I couldn't find it. And the, the Ram, you know, the Ram says I couldn't find it until eventually I remember there was a gemara in Gitin where it's mentioned by the way, and I found the gemara. So, uh, so, so the Ramam doesn't say which halacha it is, but based on the, the 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 researchers who produced the, these letters, based on all the gemaras that the Ramam looked at, they tried to. The, the Ramam says which set of halacha. He says it's a milchas or So the so based on based on. The fact that it's in Elchus Rosech and all the Ram, Gemaras that the Rambam says he looked at, um, they, they try and put together which halacha it actually was. So, Mnetz uh, when we get uh, in another couple months, we'll be there in the cycle of Rambam study, so we'll, we'll elaborate on that. Anyway, so now, this brings us to a discussion of um, the Mitzvah of Mila. Now, you may already have noticed that uh, the Mitzvah of Mila is different than all the others in this list. I mean, one is, like we said before, he was commanded concerning the mitzvah of Mila, and, um, and um, the others don't say he was commanded. So there's some ambiguity if perhaps the others were just, um, like Reuven likes to say, a minhag until Martin Tyre. But um, the other difference seems to be that there's an emphasis on, a, on, a, on Avram Avino doing the mitzvah of Mila, Whereas there is no such emphasis on ya- on the others. So, for example, um, uh, you know, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let me backtrack a second. At the beginning of the book of the Rambam, at the beginning of the Mishnah Torah, there is the list. Anybody who does the Rambam cycle daily knows this. There is a list of all the positive mitzvahs and all the negative mitzvahs. And with each one, he says Shanem, or he says which pasuk we derive this from. Now. The Rabbam says there is a mitzvah to circumcise the son. One of the mitzvahs, yeah, mitzvah to lomalas seven to circumcise one's son. Shenemar of a He brings the pasuk from Parshas Tazria, not from Parshas Lech Lecha with Avraham Avinu, mm-hmm. from Parshas Tazria, where it says on the eighth day you shall circumcise him. Now, um, it's interesting that he brings the pasuk from Yom Hashmini, not from Parshas Lech Lecha, especially because <coughs> the Rabbam says the mitzvah is lomalas habain to circumcise your son in. Parshas Tazria doesn't say anything about your son. It says to circumcise. He has to be circumcised. The mitzvah that it's the effect that it's the father's son, that, that it's the mitzvah of the father to circumcise the son, that is much more explicit in Parshas Lech Lecha. Right? So why does the Rambam categorize the mitzvah? It's not, he doesn't say the category of the mitzvah is to circumcise. It's the category of the mitzvah is to circumcise one son. And yet, he still um, abandons the pasuk in Parshas Lech Lecha and brings the Pasuk from Parshas Tazriah. Now the truth is, that this is a, th- 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 there's a Mishnah, there's a Mishnah in Kedushan that says it's a, there's mitzvahs of the father and the son. The mitzvah, the father has a son to, to circumcise, a mitzvah to circumcise his son, and if he's the firstborn child to do Pidina Ben, and to teach him Torah, and to teach him, uh, uh, yeah, to teach him uh, a fact, a uh, trade, 
etc., to teach him to swim. Yeah, all these, and the Gemara goes through, how do we know all these things? So here we have a Machlokas Bavli and Yerushalmi. How do you know that it's the father's pro- mitzvah to circumcise a son? So the Bavli, the, which is the, the, the ta- Babylonian Talmud, which we usually follow, right? He says, you learn it from Parshish Lechelcha, and Parshish Lechelcha exp- says explicitly, you have to circumcise your child. The Yerushalmi says, no, we learn it out from this Pasuk, by Yom HaShmini, that in the eighth day you circumcise it. You're, they circumcise it. How, how, that doesn't say anything about a son. But the, the way the commentaries explain the Yerushalmi is, well, if the Torah says you have to do it on the eighth day, it's kind of obvious that an eight-day-old baby can't do anything. Mm-hmm. And so, obviously, the Torah means to, um, that the father has to do it. And this is understood to be, and the, the Rebbe actually elaborates on this in the Sicha in Chelik Yudal of Parshas Boy. Uh, where the Rebbe goes through all these different mitzvahs, and the, the Rebbe basically says that the, the, these are categorically two different ways of understanding the mitzvah of Mila. The Yerushalmi holds that the mitzvah of Mila is a mitzvah for the child to do. The child can't do it, so the father has to do it. What happens if for whatever reason the child wasn't circumcised until he's posed by mitzvah? Now the father's after all, it's everybody's mitzvah. According to the Bavli, it is intrinsically a mitzvah for the father to do. So this um, this this um, reiterates our difficulty in understanding the Rambam, where in the Minyan Hamitzvahs he brings the puzzle. He says the mitzvah is to circumcise your son. In other words, he's going. So, so he should say the mitzvah from Pashat Achlazah, right? Like the Bavli says that the fact that it's the, pro- the obligation of the father is derived specifically from Parshas Lechlecha. So why does he then go and bring the Yerushalmi that says we do derive it from the pasuk in Parshas Tazria? Um, this is also further underscored with the text of the bracha. You may have noticed that when it comes to mitzvahs, asher, we always say, asher, and then there's two ways of going next. You could say, Hashem commanded us to do such and such. Asher, to fill in, to put on fill in, to wrap up in the tzitzis, to light the candles of Hanukkah. And then there are other mitzvahs which we say, al, concerning. Al Natila Shadaim, concerning the mitzvah of Natila Shadaim. Al Biur Chametz, concerning checking for the Chametz, etc. Now, there are different approaches to understand why we say one. The way the Rambam explains it is the Rambam says it depends. If you're doing a mitzvah for yourself, you say La. If you're doing a mitzvah for somebody else, you say Al. We don't do that. We don't do that like the Rambam. But the Rambam gives an example, if I recall correctly. For example, if I'm to put a mezuzah on my own house, you would say the bracha likboa mezuzah to a fix mezuzah. <laughs> if I'm going to put a mezuzah on your house, I will say al kviyas mezuzah concerning fixing mezuzahs. Right? We don't do that. We always say we have a different approach to the whole thing. Not for now. Right? Now, what is the text of the bracha for circumcision according to the Rambam? We we say the bracha al the mo- the, not with the moel says the bracha al hamila concerning circumcision. The Rambam doesn't say that. The Rambam says if you're circumcising your own son, if a moel does it, you say alamila. If you're circumcising your own son, you say lamo lesabain. Right? In other words, it's a mitzvah for me to do it for my son. Okay, so... Another element that, first of all, underscores the, the question and also gives us the key to the answer is that what I've said to you until now is the Rambam's count at the beginning of the Mishnah Torah, where he says all the mitzvahs. There's also the Rambam's Book of Mitzvahs. And in the Rambam's Book of Mitzvahs, he doesn't bring the Pasuk from Tazriah. There he brings the Pasuk from Lech Lecha. So now it's even more striking that, when he, that, that, that in the Sefer Mitzvahs, he does bring the Pasuk from Lech Lecha. So why does he change in... The mitzvah of Mila. So the way the Rebbe explains this, and I believe the Rebbe discussed this on a number of times, but I think the place that it's published at the most most elaboration is in Lukatis Sichas Chelak Lamed, Volume Thirty, and the third Sicha for Parshas Lech Lecha. Um, and the Rebbe says that based on the, we, we saw this letter from the Rambam, right, where the Rambam and, and the Pirush Mishnah, right. In other words, the Rambam is not denying the fact that there are mitzvahs that were given earlier. What he's saying is that we are. We are. We then place factory reset, and we were given the mitzvah by Moshe Rabbeinu. However, we're not saying that we therefore discount everything that was said until now. Like it says explicitly in this letter, yes, we have thirteen covenants that are connected to the mitzvah of Mila, and those thirteen covenants are found not in Parshas Tazria, which is post Matan Torah, mm-hmm. but in Parshas Lechlecha, which is Avraham Avinu. But the reason we're doing it is because our Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us to do the bris of Avraham Avinu, mm-hmm. right? So essentially. 
when the Rambam is talking in the book of mitzvahs, the book of mitzvahs is not a book of halacha. It's a, it's a book of describing the mitzvahs. If I want to describe to you what the mitzvah is, I'm going to bring to you the passage from Lech That's where you get the description of what the mitzvah is. In a book of halachas of Mishnah Torah, when I'm, telling you, when, when I'm giving you sort of the, the legal source for the mitzvah, I have to give you the post martin Torah source. Now, however, however, there still remains, and I started saying this before, there still remains a fundamental difference between the mitzvah of Mila and all the other mitzvahs that predate Matan Torah. For example, we said, Gita Nasha. Gita Nasha applied before Matan Torah. Came Matan Torah, we reset it. We don't say, like for example in this letter, or even in the Pirsha Mishnah, right? let's go to the Pirsha Mishnah. It doesn't say that we don't eat, that Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us not to eat Gita Nasha, just like Yaakov Avinu didn't eat Gita Nasha. It just says, Moshe Rabbeinu commanded but when it comes to Mila, he says, Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us, like Avram, uh, com- to circumcise ourselves, like Avram circumcised himself. And the same is true in the, in, in the letter. Also, there's emphasis on Avram Avinu, that, that we do the, the, the 13 covenants from Avram Avinu. And in fact, this is even in the Nusach HaBracha. There are, this is another unique quality to the mitzvah of Mila, most mitzvahs, you have one bracha. You say, Asher, the Shalom, to do the mitzvah. Mila has two mitzvah, two brachas. The first is a bracha that usually the Moel says, Al Hamila, mm-hmm. right? And then the father of the child makes another bracha, La Achnisa Bivrisa Shal Avram Avinu. Asher, the Shalom, to enter him. In the, so we're saying, even today, we're saying the mitzvah is to enter him in the covenant of Avram Avinu, right? We don't say when we make a bracha to separate tithes, lahafrish um, tumas like Yitzchak Avinu did. Right? No, we uh, to take right tithes. So, so clearly, when it comes to Mila, there's a strong emphasis on it being <coughs> the, the connected to Avraham Avinu. And in fact, even in the Mishnah Torah, where the Rambam brings the puzzle from Parshas Tazria, he also mentions the thirteen covenants, which of course are found in Parshas Lech Lecha. Um, and so, the Rebbe explains that there are two elements to the mitzvah of, 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 of Mila. There is the element of mitzvah of Mila that's just like any other mitzvah. That, it's one of the 613 mitzvahs, right? And then there's the mitzvah of Mila, which is it, it's, it's sort of an, over, an overarching and much... Uh, an overarching mitzvah, which is... It's a covenant about being Jewish. If you look at the, co- the words of Parshish Lechelcha, this is Hashem covenant with us that we remain the Jewish people. We remain His people. So that, the second element of it, that comes from Avram Avinu. So of course we're doing it because Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us to do it. But what did Moshe Rabbeinu command us to do? Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us to maintain the covenant of Avram Avinu that we are His people. So there's the mitzvah of Parshish Tazria, which is Vayemash Menimu Bashar al That's a mitzvah. You have to put on tefillin, you have to put on talis, you have to circumcise. It's one of the 613 mitzvahs. That doesn't tap into the essential, the, the sort of fundamental you saw it, that Mitzvah Mila is an overarching, all-encompassing mitzvah. And in fact, till today we find, uh, unfortunately, there are many, many Jews who, when it comes to 612 mitzvahs, they're not all that gung-ho. But when it comes to the Mitzvah of Mila, they do it. Because this is something which is ingrained, that we are His people. That is the covenant that Hashem made with Avraham Avinu. And that is also why, so that's why in all these places in the Rambams, even though the Rambam is saying that we do it because of Moshe Rabbeinu, but we do it because Moshe Rabbeinu, what? What did he command us? To do the covenant of Avraham Avinu. We're maintaining that covenant. And that's why, there's an interesting halakha. What happens, Rahman al if, uh, it doesn't, for whatever reason, yeah, if the father is not at the bris, I say Rahman al and I just turned to mind, there was an amazing story last week, and it was in the news, in Eretz Yisrael, there's a famous Moel who lives in Bnei Brak, I think, or wherever he lives, um, <coughs> Taimani guy, I have in my name, had the name Machput, I think. Mm-hmm. But basically, this guy has a lot of bristle, he's a very popular model. And so some people will even have a bristle later in the day um, to be able to use him, especially in Israel. In general, people often make bristle because people, um, they have like a lunch break, but people um, leave work and go home. So a lot of times people will make a bris, you know, later in the afternoon where they're going to get a bigger crowd. So it seems that uh, he was uh, overbooked and it's early, so sunset is early. So... Anyway, he's stuck in crazy, tr- crazy traffic um, on the way to the bris. And he's, he's not going to make it <laughs> in time for Shkia. And lo- he, he, he re- at some point he realizes that he calls the mother of the baby, and she's also 
in a similar area to him, also stuck in traffic with the baby in the car on the way to the bris. And he calls the father, and the father's actually stuck in traffic coming from another direction. And he was, sorry, he wasn't stuck in traffic, but he was running late from coming in another direction. And he was stopped by a cop speeding. So is the cool. father is the father is <laughs> trying to deal with a with a speeding ticket from an anti-Semitic cop, yeah, of course. Um, anyway, go read all the blogs. And, um, and but the, so, so so what does Rabbi this Rabbi do? He gets out of his car. He finds the mother. It's literally on the clock, two minutes to sunset, and he does the bris in the car. There's a picture of him leaning over the car doing the bris. The, the, her driver, I guess a taxi driver, serves as the sandik. The father is not even at his son's bris. He's dealing with the thing. But we did the mitzvah. On the eighth day, two minutes before sunset, they did the mitzvah. So uh, this is a, could be a, a good... Lincoln Continental ad. <laughs> <laughs> did the father say the bracha? Oh, oh, so that's what's getting. So no, you can't say Brach on the phone. So unfortunately, the father was not able to be at his son's bris, but fortunately, he <laughs> was able to do the mitzvah um, as prescribed in the Torah to do it on the fifth, on the eighth day. Now, um, so what happens, so you have, we said there's two brachas. There's two brachas. The bracha of Zivonu Amamila and the additional bracha of Lachnisu mm-hmm. Bevrisa Shalom Varam Avinu. So why, so, so two things. First of all, why in general, why the two brachas? Second of all, what do you do if the father's not there? So there's different opinions, but the Rambam holds that if the father's not there, you don't say the second bracha. Right? I, I believe that we pass that you do. In other words, if the father, for whatever reason, is not present, so then the Moel says both, both brachas. That's what I recall. But the Rambam says that if the father's not there, you don't say the second bracha. Says the Rebbe, these two, and again, why, why does Mila have two brachas? All mitzvahs have one bracha. So the Rebbe says, according to the Rambam, the reason why Mila has two brachas is because there's these two aspects of the mitzvah. The first bracha, v'tzivonu ala Mila, that is like, it's because it's part of the generic mitzvah. Then the second bracha, la'ach nisa b'vrisa shalavram avinu, that bracha is for this overarching concept of Mila, which is our, coven- our covenant with Hashem, that we are His people. That's why, according to the Rambam, only the father could say it. Because this is about being Jewish. What makes you Jewish is birth. The, the birth that makes you Jewish, so the parents, not the mother, that's a separate discussion, but the, the, the father who is responsible for your birth, right? He is the one who gets to say that bracha, because the emphasis of Avram, of Avram Avinu being involved in the mitzvah is specifically for that second or first, whatever you want to call it, overarching ingredient in the mitzvah of Mila, and that's why according to the Rambam, in the absence of a father, that bracha is not said.